Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com and I'd like to wish everyone a very happy 2020 Easter or Resurrection Day or whatever terminology that uh, you have uh, felt best in, uh, in your use of scruples to define it as. I tend to prefer Resurrection Day over Easter. Uh, there's been many misconceptions about the origin of the word Easter, but that's not something that we wrangle over. It's not in the least bit important. It doesn't uh, uh, result in any edification really whatsoever. But so I'd like to uh, do a, a video uh, today uh, on the subject of resurrection and I'd like to take it just a little bit uh, beyond uh, what the typical focus has always been, which, is, which has been his resurrection, and uh, try to include, from a biblical perspective, uh, try to include ourselves in that because we were raised with him when he rose. It's probably not uh, a... Uh, a message that you're used to hearing if you've if you're uh, uh, attending church uh, regularly uh, not even uh it's not even really something that you hear on Easter it's my personal opinion that we ought to be hearing this just about every uh, every message that we listen to You would have a, a you would be very hard pressed to convince me that that with with such a reference to our identification with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, the fact that we were raised with him, the fact that that is mentioned so often in Scripture and referred to so often, you'd be awful hard pressed to convince me that that is not something that we should take seriously. There's a reason why God included us in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And uh, re that resurrection is only one part of it. It's death, burial, resurrection. In fact, we were ascended with him and we are in fact co-seated in the heavenlies in Christ. So when we come to Easter, you know, we're at that time when we call to mind that he rose from the dead. And which I, I just, I'm sorry, but I, I have to say that I, I find that somewhat odd from, from a calendar perspective, since we as Christians ought to be consciously driven to that fact every single day of our lives, every single day of the year. So I just want to take the opportunity to just chat for a little bit with you. Timothy chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Jesus Christ of the seed of David. The royal, promised monarch in David's line raised from the dead according to my gospel. And that's the good news that we preach. A literal bodily resurrection is the very basis of Christianity. But it's not the basis of what I see, you know, as modern philosophy. The world at large seems to say that there was this, there was this mysterious guy. He was, his name was Jesus. He did a lot of good. You know, it was said that he performed miracles, though we, we know that miracles don't really happen. You know, but he did go around doing good. He did help a lot of people. You know, he had a, a lot of great ideas. You know, we ought to make peace, not war. The idea appears to be that he lives in principle or, or he lives mystically somehow. You know, it doesn't matter if he actually died and his body decayed. You know, what we have is a principle that lives on. I heard one person calling it the, a noble lie. Yet we know that it cannot be called Christian if it doesn't include a literal bodily resurrection from the dead. 
you know, channels like the History Channel, uh, Modern Science. They, they try to find a rational, natural explanation for biblical miracles. You know, you know it appears as though the intellectual opposition to this is the preconceived idea that miracles can't happen. And once we've concluded that miracles cannot happen, then it's impossible that Jesus Christ rose literally from the dead. And we're surrounded, we're hemmed in on every side by those who say that, well, there's no evidence to that. The only reason that they can suggest that there's no evidence is that they have a prejudice against God's Word or they've eliminated all Scripture from their reasoning. It doesn't even factor into their calculations. We have credible witnesses. Luke's a credible witness. John's a credible witness. Peter's a credible witness. Paul is a credible witness. There were a great number of witnesses to his resurrection. It would be absolutely impossible in any court of law to impugn the testimony of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and so on and so forth. There are credible witnesses, but I'm not doing some video here to prove that Christ rose from the dead. You people know that. I'm here to point out that that's the very basis of our hope. Christianity involves a literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was real. It really happened. If he was not born of the seed of David and he, and he did not become man of very man, then he's not our kinsman redeemer. If he didn't raise from the dead, then immediately all of what we call Christianity just evaporates. It disappears. If Jesus Christ did not really die in your place, then there is no remedy for sin. The bodily resurrection of Christ was actually used by God as a sign that his claims are valid. He didn't say, well, my claims are valid because, you know, I changed water into wine. He didn't claim to be truthful, to be God Almighty incarnate because he healed a leper or he gave sight to the blind. And I, I recognize that these were valid activities, but they are activities that can almost be duplicated by somebody who's good at the art. But a resurrection is difficult to fake. You know, you can meet the person, shake his hand, absolutely know he's alive. You saw him dead. You saw him embalmed. You saw him placed in the tomb. And then three days later, you see him again. It's difficult to fake that. Oh, I mean, you could suggest that some kind of drug might have been used that made him look dead. All of that's beside the point. We are Christians. God demands that we have a kinsman redeemer. And that means if he's my kinsman redeemer, then he redeemed all of his kinsmen. Somehow modern Christianity has said, everybody out there is a possible kinsman, which is just to be blunt, a lie. My sheep hear my voice. He said, what did he come to do? Deliver his people, not everyone, his people from their sin. They were already his people. If he's not our kinsman redeemer, we're not redeemed. And he can't be our kinsman redeemer if he's not truly man. And if he's truly man, it's absolutely mandatory. Absolutely mandatory that he die in our place. For the soul that sins shall surely die. So we can rejoice in verses such as, by the disobedience of Adam we were made sinners, and by the obedience of Christ we were made righteous. I'll say that again. By the obedience of Christ we were made righteous. Text couldn't be more clear. You're righteous because he was obedient, not because of anything you did. We can skip over that, folks. We can skip over it without ever really contemplating the depth of the, the theology involved. You weren't made righteous by anything you did. You weren't made righteous because you accepted, believed, received, repented, or anything else. You were made righteous. This book says you were made righteous because Christ was obedient and He came to redeem His people. 
If you're not his people, you're not redeemed. You had nothing to do with it. By the disobedience of Adam, you were made a sinner. You didn't have anything to do with that. You didn't make any decision about that. Likewise, by the obedience of Christ, you were made righteous. And if he is not man as well as God, a very God, if he was not your kinsman, and if he did not die in your place, none of these things are true. And if Christ be not raised from the dead, we are of all men most to be pitied. Christianity is a supernatural religion. I don't even like the word religion, but if we're going to use that word, Christianity is a supernatural religion. I make no apologies for believing in a God who not only created the heavens and the earth, but can do what he wills to do. In fact, I am told that God did what he willed to do both in heaven and in earth and in all deep places. It is he who is working in me, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. I'm thrilled that my God is God. He's not some impotent deity who's, who wishes I were different than I am, who has some kind of hope which he's not able to complete. That I, that I might obey him, receive him, accept him, or whatever. He is the sovereign monarch of eternity. And the worship that we have is a supernatural worship. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. God spoke the world into existence. The iron did swim and the sun stood still. This God is our God. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, we have no confidence in his claim. None. Someone mentioned to me, you know, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I will come in and sup with him. And Christians ask me to believe that coming in and supping with him means redemption. Redemption, folks, is redemption. Fellowship is fellowship. Those are different words, but I also have the testimony of Scripture that the only one who hears my voice and opens the door is already my sheep. And yet I hear it preached as though, if you'll open the door and hear his voice, you'll become a sheep. Well, you wouldn't hear his voice and open the door if you were not already his sheep. Why don't we believe this book, folks? Why? I'm persuaded that God was not kidding when he said that he would send a famine in the land, not a famine for food or a, a thirst for water, but of hearing my words, saith the Lord. It's no wonder that so many Christians have very little peace, very little rest, and very little confidence. If Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then these claims are true. He's my Redeemer. He came to deliver his people from their sins. He did that. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He did that. Christ declared on the cross. He cried out, in fact, it is finished. Was he kidding? Is it finished or isn't it? There are those Christians who, who know what those words truly mean. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never cease to sustain and uphold you. How do I know that that's true? How do I know that he bottles my tears? How do I know that he lights my candle? That he knows the way I take? And when he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. How do I know that I stand before God holy, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight? Or that I've been translated into the heavenlies? Yet those things are, are apparently, they're not very precious today in modern Christianity, in modern Christian circles. You don't hear those things talked about. Folks, you ought to rejoice in the fact that you are his child, that he's a father who loves you, who holds you, who directs you, a father whom you can absolutely trust. And the basis of that trust in Christ's resurrection from the dead we read in Romans that he was delivered because of our offenses. Why did Christ come? Because God's people were sinners. 
He was delivered because of our offenses. I didn't write that, okay? God did. He was delivered because of our offenses and he was raised again because we are made righteous. I know in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ that the price that he paid is sufficient. And I only know that because of his resurrection. Folks, if we had not been made righteous, he could not have raised from the dead. And that's the entire family and household of God, not just a select few. Sons of God who have not yet been born were made righteous in the finished work of Jesus Christ. If that isn't true, I don't understand language. Scripture says in Romans 4.25 that he was raised because of our justification. And so I know that the price that he paid was sufficient. Had it not been enough, he would have remained dead. It almost staggers the mind to consider God Almighty incarnate in human flesh, the Lamb of God, slain from before the foundation of the world, before God ever created the heavens and the earth, before he ever placed Adam in the Garden of Eden, had decreed the death of Jesus Christ in my place. What a marvelous, marvelous realization that I was always in the eyes, always in the heart, always in the plan of my God. Never once has he ever forsaken me or ceased to guide and sustain and, and uphold me. I know that he who knew no sin was made sin for me. And it's easy for us to treat sin casually. What did it cost you to be free from the guilt of sin? Absolutely nothing. But it cost God all he had. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. Are you honestly asking me to believe that God is sitting up in heaven, wringing his hands and saying, now I got to wait and see who my son died for? Or was this all in the decree of the almighty eternal God? For several years now, I have pointed out to you dearly beloved people of God. The language is very clear. He didn't die for me. He died in my place. There's a huge difference. He didn't die to leave some question mark in the place of history. He died in my place, therefore I cannot die. If God sends me to hell, he will have exacted a double payment for my sin, and that would be unrighteous. So what do I do with my Redeemer, who has made sin and has risen from the dead? I'm going to suggest that that life, his life, that life that walked out of that empty tomb, that life that was raised from the dead, which Christians all over the world today are celebrating, that Christians celebrate every year. That life is the life that is lived in and through our lives as Christians. And before you say, well, of course, Steve, I know that. That's kind of a no-brainer. Think about what I just said. That very life, his life, the one whose resurrection made me righteous before God, lives his life in and through our lives today. We don't live it. He does. That's what I'm saying. And I have no problem whatsoever contrasting that resurrection life with the popular traditional idea so prevalent today that, well, it is I who lives, not Christ who lives in me. How could we have strayed so far from the truth? That righteousness is, is somehow achieved on the human level and that through law keeping is a rule of life. Why were you identified? Why you, were you and I identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection? Why? So that we can live the life that he intended.
Most Christians today don't even believe that they were made the righteousness of God in Christ. That They don't even believe that positionally they stand before God. You know, there's a difference in standing and walking, okay? They, they, don't, they don't even understand. Many don't. Most, I would say, in fact, don't. They don't, even, they don't even believe that they were made the righteousness of God in Christ. That they stand before Him as righteous as His Son. As, that when the Father looks at us, He sees us as righteous as His Son. They don't, they don't know that. They don't believe that. Many don't. In fact, I'll, I'll go as far as to say most don't. That's just our standing. But now, we got to go someplace. We have a walk. What about conditionally? How are we going to walk? You know, the, the world celebrates Easter as though His resurrection is, is evidence qualifying us for heaven if we should so determine it you know, based upon some action or some decision on our part, and that is not the truth. Why, when he died and rose from the dead, do so many not have assurance in their lives for the forgiveness of sin, the lack of guilt? Folks, if you carry a load of sin, if you have a guilty sense before God, then you don't understand the Scriptures. And you surely don't understand the grace of God. The sacrifices of the law could not remove the conscious guilt of sin. But Christ did. We've been perfected forever by His one sacrifice. He's not sacrificed over and over again, which Christians do, tend to do, when they bounce back and forth between a, a clean and guilty conscience. I not only have the confidence of my standing before Him, but the confidence of His return to rule and reign in righteousness. And, and I suggest to you that the resurrection is the testimony of His right to reign. No one could call into question why the man Christ Jesus should not rule and reign. We have a God-man sitting on the, on the throne in glory, interceding on our behalf. There's one mediator between man and God, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Folks, I want you to read what an already born-again, heaven-bound believer wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Philippians chapter 3. Okay? If by any means I might attain Subjunctive mood in the grammar, in the Greek grammar. You Greek students out there, maybe y'all attain unto the, the resurrection of the dead, the out-resurrection of the dead. What are you going to do with that verse? What are you going to do with that verse? I'm talking to every single Christian out there that, that can hear my voice. What are you going to do with that verse? Philippians 3.11 I might attain. Well, if he's, if he's really a Christian... Why would it be a subjunctive mood? Why would it, there be the mood of uncertainty there? Maybe I'll attain it. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll attain unto the resurrection of, of the dead. Maybe I won't. Because he's not talking about a bodily, physical resurrection from the dead, as in you're a corpse, dead. Okay, That's not what Paul is referring to. He's actually referring to something much grander than that. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. What's, what, what is it? What, what do you think he's talking about, folks? All things as loss? You think he's talking about money and finances and relationships, you know, pets and, you know, whatever. Help. He's talking about the loss of ourselves, losing ourselves for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in Him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith 
to know him and the power of his resurrection. The power of it and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the out resurrection of the dead. The word there is unique in all of scripture. It's only used once, one time in the New Testament. Out resurrection of the dead. He goes on to say, not as though I had already attained. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I, also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is that high calling? Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Listen, folks, it's Easter. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What is that? His life, not our own. Colossians 3.1 if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. What is that? It's the finished work of Christ. Not on things on the earth. What is that? Law, flesh, self. Verse 3, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 2.12, and having been buried with him in baptism, you were raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Galatians 2, 19 and 20. For I through the law am dead to the law, that, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die, that is to die to self, is gain. So happy funeral, and happy, happy resurrection day. I love you all, I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve, thanks for watching.